This week on Brian Ross Investigates. A day of reckoning for the man whose millions of followers call him the Apostle, Jesus on Earth. Nason Garcia admitting in court he sexually abused young girls in his church. Do you remember when you wanted me to bring my little sister to you so that you can finally hurt them? These days, countless young girls in this church from being abused by this man and sentenced to prison and as to the defendant i say you are a sexual predator <laughs> defendant's levied a term in state prison of 16 years and eight months dozens outside the los angeles courthouse protesting He's a criminal. He's a criminal. some of his victims say the apostle got off easy it's a slap in the face they slapped us in the face. Plus, this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the choices made by the editors of Mediaite. From the studios of the Law and Crime Trial Network in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to everyone watching us on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined as always by my colleague, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin tonight with the day of reckoning for a man who calls himself the Apostle, the leader of a church that claims five million members in the United States and around the world. They saw Joaquin Garcia has now pleaded guilty to sexually abusing young girls in his church under a plea deal that some of his victims felt let him off too easily, Rhonda. That's right, Brian. At the sentencing hearing in a Los Angeles courtroom, prosecutor Patricia Fusco said no man of God would ever do what he did to these victims, the so-called Jane Doe's, who in emotional testimony told the judge of the impact of his crimes on them, all as Garcia stared straight ahead stone-faced, never looking once at his victims. I am Jane Doe 4. I am overwhelmed with emotion as I stand here today. I want to start by clearly stating that Nason and this church have ruined my life. Every aspect of it. I have suffered more trauma and pain than I can ever begin to describe. All I have ever wanted was to see Nason go to trial for what he did to me, to us, to speak the truth in this courtroom, my truth and to tell the world who this man really is. I had no way out. He didn't just rape me over and over again. You were evil and merciless. I went from being an innocent virgin to experiencing the most vile and revolting treatment ever. Do you remember when you wanted me? to bring my little sister to you so that you can finally hurt her too. I told you, she's only 14. Do you remember what you said to me? Do you remember saying that I should have brought her to you sooner? Do you remember? When you commanded me <laughs> to have sex with one of your dogs as your 50th birthday present, <laughs> do you remember telling me how much you wanted your husky to defile me? <laughs> Was you raping me not enough? <laughs> I'm done. Of the 
evil monster who abused me, raped me, broke me for so long. I didn't have a voice, and I didn't think that anyone would care enough to hear me. And the prosecutor told the judge that the five young women who had come forward to testify had paid a price for their bravery, being threatened by members of the church. I'm imploring every member of this church today to stop harassing these women. They are not enemies of the church. They were brave enough to stand up to this man. They should be heroes in all of their minds. They saved countless young girls in this church from being abused by this man, by being brave enough to come forward, and now he's going to prison. Under the terms of his deal, Garcia pleaded to only three of the 36 counts he was originally charged with some three years ago. Judge Ronald Cohen was unsparing in his sentencing of the church leader. And I've never ceased to amaze, be amazed at what some people do in the name of religion and how lives are ruined in the guise of serving a supreme being. As to the Jane Doe's, at this point, I apologize, my hands are tied. Lawyers do what lawyers do, and at this point my hands are tied. But I further want to tell all the Jane Doe's that the world has heard you. I promise you that. As to those family members that have abandoned the Jane Doe's, shame. Shame on you. And as to the defendant, I say, you are a sexual predator. <laughs> Defendants living in a term of state prison of 16 years and eight months. It's fair to say that no one has worked harder to bring the apostle to justice than Socho Martin. Socho, now that he has pleaded guilty and been sentenced to prison, what is your reaction? Well, Brian, my reaction and that of the, the reaction of the victims of Nathan Joaquin, not only sexually were we violated by him, but we were also extorted, we were trafficked, and these young women, and I'm talking about the minors, in, in this particular situation, we're talking about children here. They were trafficked, they were sexually assaulted by Mr. Garcia, and they were violated by the entire organization. And still, still they made a deal with a sexual terrorist. Prosecutors say that may have been the best deal they could have made. What do you say to that? I say that they, it's a slap in the face. They slapped us in the face and they put us in a hole. That's what I think. And I think it's all BS, that that's the best deal they could have made, that's BS. There's something very eerie and very wrong going on in this case. The church now says, we will wait for you, apostle. What does that mean in terms of any change inside this church? There's not an internal investigation going on in the light of the world. That's never existed. They have always, always supported this pedophile, this rapist, this criminal, and who he, he himself just confessed that he was. And still the bishops and the hierarchy are still lying to the members. So, so you put your life on the line and others did to come forward to testify and provide evidence to prosecutors. Uh, do you now fear there'll be some sort of retaliation against you and the others who came forward? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This will absolutely happen. Um, they, they don't understand that this is not a, an, an organized religion. This is an organized institution of criminal activities. This has been running for 96 years. And these are people that run like, com they, they, they act like common thugs, like common thieves, and they are they will do anything 
in order to make sure that this enterprise maintains itself sturdy and strong. What do you intend to do now? Well, there's a, there, there's a RICO civil suit. This is a racketeering case. And so this is a federal racketeering case, and we expect the, the federal authorities to come in and finish what the Department of, of California, the Department of Justice of the state of California, couldn't do. So what do you say to the California Attorney General? How dare you? So outrage doesn't seem to describe the depth of your feelings here, Social. No, I, I just, I, I'm leaving all of my, my pain and I'm leaving all of my sadness aside because I need to be strong. I need to be strong because there are so many survivors out there that can't speak for, them, for themselves. I will not sit down and cry. I will not sit down and give up and cross my hands and, and wait and see what happens. I can't. So for you, the fight for justice is still far from over? Oh, it's just beginning. This is the beginning of their end. Soto Martin, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. <sighs> thank you, Brian, for having me. When we come back, the Apostles Church is standing by him, saying its millions of members still don't believe the charges against him, despite his plea of guilty to being a predator pedophile. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. One of the women who was set to testify against the apostle was one of his so-called handmaidens, Alondra Ocampo. She had already pleaded guilty and agreed to turn against him. Her husband, Christopher Kellermeyer, talks about what happens next. What is her reaction to his guilty plea and the deal he cut with the California Attorney General? When she heard that, she started crying and she uh, got nauseous, really um, you know, she told me on the phone that she became nauseous because she's thinking about, you know, all the people who are going to continue to be victimized once he's back in front of the church, especially, you know, people in Mexico, um, where you know, the long arm of the United States um, law won't be able to get to him. So um, the church says they're going to wait for him. What do you think that means? It literally means that, that they'll be praying. Uh, for him, they'll be receiving his instructions from jail via letters and correspondence. So you think, in other words, it means nothing really is going to change in that church? Exactly. So what does this mean for your wife then? Well, it's devastating for her because, well, what it means for her with the with the uh, well, with the pleading guilty is that nothing changes. And she was prepared to testify, hoping she could put him behind bars. Correct. Yes. And, you know, not uh, for what he did to her, for what he did to other girls, for how he's manipulated people and just treated uh, people are basically just cash cows. Uh, it's a business, you know, and it's also, you know, a, um, a, a generations of, is a system that creates generations of abusers and victims. So what is her message? What is your message to members of the church tonight? She's saying this is all true and it all happened. And this is very sad that it that he'll be uh, probably alive in, uh, in, in 10 years and be able to be back in front of the church and able to harm people again. How do you feel about that? Oh, I, I, think, I think it's horrible. But, you know, Alondra is also very sad, too, because her parents still don't believe her. And uh, that's very sad for her. Uh, because, you know, the people that brought her in this world, brought her into this church, uh, the thing are, are basically calling her a liar still. And so, yeah, it's not a good time right now for anyone in terms of happiness, uh, because a lot of family members are still, you know, adhering to that faith and uh, sticking strong to it. You know, just, it's unfortunate. Mr. Calamara, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. No problem.
The lawyer for Ms. Ocampo has been on both sides of the legal battle over the apostle, working first for the defense until his client cut her own deal. He says the deal now cut by the prosecutors with the apostle makes sense to him. You've been involved in this case now for several years. What do you think led the attorney general's office to accept this plea deal? So at the end of the day, they want uh, the surety that, um, you know, the apostle is going to be held accountable for his actions. Although there was a slew of evidence against him, you just never know how a jury is going to react. You never know how a trial is going to unfold. And the apostle's defense team is amongst the best in the nation, led by Alan Jackson. So there was always the chance that something might go awry. Furthermore, um, by accepting a plea, they don't have to put the victims through the trauma of testimony and cross-examination. And I'm sure that was uh, one of the considerations that they took into account when reaching this plea bargain with uh, Nason. Some of the women, some of the survivors feel that he's getting off easy. What do you think? I think 16 years is... Um, <clears throat> I think some people might view that as a light sentence in comparison to the, to the gravity of what he has done and the charges that he is facing. Uh, however, you know, there's an old saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, he is pleading guilty to sex crimes. He is getting, being sentenced to double digits. So, you know, could the attorney general's office have pressed for a few more years? Possibly. Um, but I think this is still a considerable sentence, you know, uh, for, for, for a man who just, you know, a few years ago was, was, was the head of a church and, and, and beloved by all. And now the church says, we will wait for you, suggesting they'll wait for him to come out of prison. That perhaps he can run the church from behind bars. What's that message? He's already making excuses for what he's done. But, you know, I mean, is this a surprise? This is a man who has committed atrocities, you know, in the name of the, in the name of God, in the name of his church, and everything is an excuse. You know, this is, oh, this is, it's not me that's doing this. This is what God wants you to do. How do you think he'll do in prison for the next uh, decade or so? Not too well. Um, you know, uh, I, I, you know, sex offenders and people accused of molesting children uh, always have a difficult time in prison. But, you know, I'm sure he'll survive. I doubt it'll be happy. Uh, and it shouldn't be. All right. Fred Sreharaja, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you, Brian. Up next, this week's winners and losers in the media. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams Media Group. And Aidan, who's chosen as your a winner this week, the actor Matthew McConaughey, a hometown boy from Ovalde, Texas, who took to the White House press room to talk about the need for gun legislation. My day wore green high-top converse with a heart she had hand-drawn on the right toe because they represented her love of nature. Camilla's got these shoes. Can you show these shoes, please? Wore these every day. Green Converse with a heart on the right toe. These are the same green Converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. How about that, shit? A powerful presentation by a skilled actor, Aiden. That's right. Uh, so Matthew McConaughey delivered this incredibly emotional speech uh, from the White House a press briefing room uh, to reporters there, and it lasted roughly 20 minutes. Um, and he recounted the stories of the children that were murdered at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, where he is from. 
Um, it was an incredible ode to those children. It was so powerful that uh, you could see there uh, Karine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary, uh, even shed tears. Um, he also made a call for gun reform. Um, he outlined that uh, this is not a partisan issue or that it should not be. Um, and he laid out a few responsible gun reform measures that he thinks uh, should be passed, which include uh, expanding background checks, red flag laws, uh, waiting periods for uh, rifles that are very popular, like the AR-15, and raising the age to buy those weapons from 18 to 21 years old. Now, Matthew McConaughey is an incredible messenger, I think, on this issue, uh, because he is from Texas. Uh, he speaks a lot about his family values. Uh, he also said in the speech that he was raised revering guns and had a lot of guns growing up. And he also said that, you know, in, a, in Uvalde, he spoke to a lot of these parents who themselves said that they support the Second Amendment, but they still think that there should be limitations on it uh, so that massacres like this do not happen uh, at elementary school specifically. Uh, I think a testament to how good that speech was from the White House podium uh, in the press briefing room was the fact that Fox News anchors actually praised Matthew McConaughey in the aftermath, and even Fox News' partisan primetime opinion hosts refrained from attacking him, which is not something that they usually do uh, when it comes to Hollywood actors that disagree with them on politics. And for this week's Losers, Fox News for its decision on how to handle the January 6th committee hearings. That's right. So we have the January 6th uh, committee hearings that are starting this week. Um, Fox News is not airing them in prime time, uh, which uh, all other news networks are doing. Now, this is not surprising at all. Uh, the hearings start at 8 p.m., which is right when Tucker Carlson's show airs. Um, Tucker Carlson's show is the most popular one on Fox News, and he has spent the last couple months railing against these hearings. Um, so the idea that he would air them in full, like the other networks are doing, um, it, it strains credulity. But it's still deeply embarrassing for Fox News. These are eminently newsworthy hearings. And now Fox News is taking their two best anchors, Brett Baer and Martha McCallum, and making them host uh, the hearing special over on Fox Business, um, which is viewed by far fewer people than Fox News. So it does a disservice to their readers, uh, and it's a little bit of a stab at journalistic uh, responsibility here. And yet they're sticking with that decision. Yeah, they are, uh, despite the immense backlash. And, you know, Fox News says that they're airing it on their streaming platform, Fox Nation, in full. They're also airing it on Fox Business. Um, but it, suffice to say that Fox News is what's viewed by most people, um, and they will not be airing these hearings. So much of the country will see them, but not the regular viewers of Fox News. That's right. Aidan McLaughlin, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. And thanks to all of you for joining us here on Brian Ross Investigates. We'll see you again here next week.